Good morning. I'm Amy Tuninga, director of the PSEG Institute for Sustainability Studies at Montclair State University. Today, we are launching the 2020 Green Teams program, a program we were able to develop because of the generous partnership with PSEG, for which we are very grateful. We will discuss the program in more detail later, but in brief, we partner teams of five students coming from different disciplines, different majors and different universities together with corporations and other organizations to address sustainability challenges. As we kick off the 2020 program, we are joined by Ralph Izzo as our keynote speaker. Ralph Izzo has been chairman and CEO of Public Service Enterprise Group Incorporated, PSEG, since April 2007. He has been the company's president and COO and a member of the board of directors of PSEG since October 2006. Previously, Mr. Izzo was president and COO of Public Service Electric and Gas Company, PSE and G. Since joining PSE and G in 1992, Mr. Izzo has held several executive positions, including PSE and G Senior Vice President of Utility Operations, PSE and G's Vice President of Appliance Service. PSEG, Vice President of Corporate Planning, and PSEG, Vice President of Electric Ventures. Mr. Izzo is a well known leader within the utility industry as well as the public policy arena. He is the chair of the Nuclear Energy Institute and a member of the U.S. Department of Energy's Fusion Energy Sciences Advisory Committee. Mr. Izzo received his Bachelor of Science and Master of Science degrees in Mechanical Engineering and his Doctor of Philosophy degree in Applied Physics from Columbia University as well as an honorary doctor of science degree from Montclair State University in 2019. Dr. Izzo, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here today. My pleasure, thank you, Amy. I probably don't have to tell this group, but nonetheless, I will mention what the science says about climate change. And two reports I like to reference, one of them I'll do now, is what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change commissioned by the United Nations had to say about this fact. And basically some targets were set that we are fully aware of in order to achieve no more than a one and a half degree Celsius rise in temp global temperature by the year 2030. We're nowhere near the pace that we need to be to achieve the targets described by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. In fact, except for the significant change in our behavioral patterns and in our economy that have taken place as a result of COVID-19. If I simply block that out for the moment, our carbon dioxide emissions and our greenhouse gas emissions have been going up. Uh, the five things that we can do to address climate change are number one, set a price on carbon. Number two, use that price to guide four subsequent actions. The first of those four is the development of renewable energy. The second is the preservation of nuclear power. The third and my favorite that we'll spend some time talking about is energy efficiency. And last but not least is the electrification of our economy with this cleaner supply and in particular, the electrification of transportation. Let's talk a little bit about power prices first and foremost. If I were to show you a chart of what power prices have done over the past four years, or for that matter, over the past 10 years, you would see that they have been declining. And in fact, our predictions of the future decline have been consistently wrong. The decline has been greater than the expected decline. The primary reason for this has been what we refer to as the shale gas revolution in the United States. Previously, the number one fuel for electricity generation in the United States was coal. That has now been surpassed by natural gas. As recently as 2010, the cost of natural gas was anywhere from eight to $10 per MMBTU, per million BTUs. That same unit of natural gas now costs typically $2 to $2.50 literally a 75% reduction in the price of natural gas has resulted in coal no longer being the dominant fuel that's used to power our electric plants, but natural gas being that number one fuel. The benefit of that has been a natural reduction in carbon emissions, because for every megawatt hour of electricity that's produced by coal, we emit roughly one ton of carbon. 
that same megawatt hour of electricity produced by natural gas emits half a ton. So left to its own devices, the electric system in the United States did result in lower natural gas emissions from the electric power supply in the United States. A microcosm, but a significant part of the global climate uh, picture. A price on carbon is instrumental in allowing us to recognize the damage that we are doing to our environment and what it's costing us. So here I'll refer to my second and final paper that uh, I will make use of in this discussion. And that is a paper that was uh, written by the National Academy of Sciences in 2017. And it was really a survey paper. Uh, the, what the Academy did is looked at all of the research that had been done up until that date and the various models that had been run to come up with what they believe to be a natural price on carbon. The price on carbon in today's dollars that the National Academy came up with was $50 per ton. So at $50 per ton, the National Academy said, gee, we ought to be willing to spend up to that amount to avoid the consequences of climate change in the future. And those consequences are many, right? Shifting global patterns, sea level rise, you, know, you, you are fully aware of the impacts. But if we are going to spend above and beyond that $50, then we would be doing more than the models predicted is necessary, and perhaps taking away from some resources that could be deployed in other challenging social problems. And there are many and in the world of finite resources, despite my uh, compassion and my, my passion for tackling climate change, I'm sure there are other folks who realize that resources can uh, be deployed in equally important topics. So if I take you to the next slide to describe what a price on carbon would mean, let's just take a look at the bar on the left. For today's efficient natural gas turbines, at current prices for natural gas that we've already mentioned, that power plant could produce electricity at $13 per megawatt hour. A nuclear plant probably costs nowadays, this slide is a little dated, a little bit under $30 per megawatt hour. So the natural gas plant would be called upon by the market to produce electricity as often as it possibly can. And in fact, it would be viewed as far more competitive than the nuclear power plant. However, if we were to take the National Academy of Sciences point of view and say, hold on just a second, that gas plant is emitting half a ton of carbon. So its cost to society is not $13 per megawatt hour, but it's really 13 plus 25. Then suddenly you see that the nuclear plant is more competitive than the natural gas plant. Sadly, the absence of a price on carbon in the United States and the absence of carbon regulation that imparts a price on carbon in the United States doesn't reflect this kind of more realistic competitive marketplace. And in fact, the gas plant tends to be the fuel of choice in competitive power markets in the US today. So if we go to the next slide, we can talk a little bit about what that might mean for the types of power supplies that we should uh, consider developing. And in particular, renewable energy. Many states have developed programs that are supportive of renewable energy. And they have basically made sure that in the absence of this price on carbon, that we have uh, subsidies that can offset the advantage that a natural gas might have. Now, let's spend a little bit of time talking about what some of these renewable energy supplies mean in different parts of the country. And in particular, let's focus on New Jersey. So New Jersey should be very proud of its efforts in solar energy. We actually rank seventh in the nation in installed solar capacity. However, if we compare how often that capacity runs even though New Jersey has many things that it can boast about, the Giants, Bruce Springsteen, the shore, uh, its history, it doesn't get quite as much sunshine as Nevada, Arizona, and other states. 
So when we look at how often those solar panels that allow us to rank seventh in the nation run, we are last among the top 10 energy states in effectiveness as measured by this capacity factor. I limit myself to 10 only because once you drop below the top 10 states, you get some disparities in the data because the number of installations are so few. If we were to think about how much the subsidy, the primary subsidy is that is necessary to make solar economic in New Jersey, it's delivered through a mechanism known as the Solar Renewable Energy Credit or an SREC. You see here that for the past five or so years, that SREC has been roughly $200 or so uh, per ton. If one were to then say, okay, every megawatt hour that's coming from that solar panel is wonderful because it displaces a megawatt hour that would have come from a natural gas plant. Then you can calculate the amount of carbon avoided by that solar panel. And since the solar panel is costing this $200 per megawatt hour to subsidize, what is the cost that we are paying to avoid that ton of carbon? And that's the red line you see on this slide. And you can see that nowadays that price is getting close to $400 per ton. So according to the National Academy of Sciences, solar in New Jersey as it's currently subsidized is eight times more expensive than we should be paying for carbon mitigation. That does not mean that solar energy is a bad thing. That simply means that solar energy is not economic as currently deployed in New Jersey. The numbers would be very different if we looked at it in California, Nevada, Florida, and other states where the solar impingement rate is so much stronger and where the cost of land is so much less. And those states tend to not emphasize rooftop solar, but in fact, grid connected solar. There it is actually a very prudent economic choice. Let's take a look at another form of renewable energy that's being considered in New Jersey, offshore wind. Now here, uh, we don't have any data to speak of because we don't have an offshore wind installation yet. However, what we do have is New Jersey's commitment to build seven and a half gigawatts, 7,500 megawatts of offshore wind by 2035. And in fact, the first 1.1 thousand megawatts or 1.1 gigawatts is expected to be operational by 2024. In fact, we are currently in negotiation to be in partnership with the developer of that project known as the Orsted Company. And there's a, there's a chance we will know by the end of the year whether or not PSCG is a partial owner of that. The Board of Public Utilities recently extended a contract to Orsted uh, for that offshore wind, so such that for every megawatt hour of electricity it produces, uh, it would be willing to pay $98 and escalate that by 2% per year. Now, just by way of reminder, uh, we didn't spend much time on the slide earlier, but that price of electricity nowadays in this part of the country is closer to $30 per megawatt hour. So if you look at what the magnitude of the subsidy is here, and you do that same exercise we talked about a few moments ago, that this is avoiding a half a ton of carbon coming out of a gas plant, the subsidy in this case is much less than solar. It's only about $100 per ton of CO2 removed. Uh, still two times what the National Academy of Sciences says we should be paying. And in fact, onshore wind in many parts of the country, Western Texas, the Great Plains states, even some parts of Appalachia can be provided at below uh, the cost of the $50 per ton of carbon. So once again, a price on carbon would simply help us make more economic decisions on the very important aspect of battling climate change, of developing renewable technology in the right locations. Now, as it turns out, offshore wind is a good location given the robustness of the wind resource off of our coast. The problems are more in the lack of infrastructure to develop the offshore wind farms, uh, the, 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 the vessels that are necessary to do the construction work, the absence of a mature regulatory system. In fact, the existence of a federal law that 
uh, impairs our ability to develop offshore wind efficiently, known as the Jones Act. The belief, and I, I do believe this is true, that over time, as this industry matures, these prices will come down and offshore wind is a robust enough resource that it will be competitive with that National Academy of Science price for carbon mitigation. Not as convinced of that uh, with rooftop solar in New Jersey. So let's go to step number three in battling climate change and let's discuss nuclear energy. Currently nuclear power is the nation's single largest source of carbon free energy. Uh, in New Jersey, it's responsible for 90% of our carbon free electricity and it is responsible for 40% of all of New Jersey's electricity. And the existing nuclear power plants in the state avoid about 13 million tons of carbon emissions per year. They too, because of the absence of a price on carbon, are more expensive to run than gas plants. So New Jersey has had to subsidize nuclear power plants in New Jersey. In full disclosure, we own those nuclear power plants, PSEG does. Next slide. They have been subsidized to the tune of $10 per megawatt hour. Do the same exercise as before. That avoids the emission of half a ton of carbon from, uh, and I'm using round numbers as you, for those of you who are doing the arithmetic, you can see it's not exactly half a ton. So that basically says that we are spending $17 per ton of carbon dioxide by virtue of this subsidy for nuclear. So you could see that this is well below the cost of renewable power in New Jersey and well below the National Academy of Sciences, $50 per ton of cost associated with emitting carbon dioxide. So it pays to preserve existing nuclear power plants. The arithmetic would be very different if we talk about building new nuclear power. And I'm not going to show a slide on that because it would not be economic under the current uh, regulatory system that we have to build and the current technology that we have to build a new nuclear plant. Uh, one would be better off continuing the development of offshore wind in terms of the current economics and the current technology, uh, albeit uh, still a factor of two higher than what the National Academy says we should be spending. So the fourth topic I'd like to discuss with you is my favorite topic, uh, energy efficiency. It tends to get, regrettably, the least amount of, ten of attention from policymakers, and it is by far the most effective first step in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. You simply reduce the demand for electricity. So the cleanest megawatt is the megawatt hour that does not need to be produced. In fact, if you look at the nation's track record over the past 30 years, you can see that even though it hasn't gotten the amount of attention it deserves, the amount of energy efficiency that we've introduced through appliance standards, just through improvements in technology are such that uh, we've avoided having to build 300 large power plants, which is a pretty impressive number. In fact, today, if we go to the next slide, we have put, we PSEG have uh, been petitioning the Board of Public Utilities to allow us to make energy efficiency our single largest investment. We're asking for a permission to invest two and a half billion dollars in something that would create jobs, lower customer bills, and help clean the environment. And it's not magic. It's simply the fact that there are technologies that are available that the market does not automatically compel consumers to invest in for a whole host of reasons that we can go into that make perfect sense from a consumer point of view, but make no sense from an environmental or public policy point of view. And in the absence of these investments, New Jersey unlike before where we ranked seventh in solar installations and in second in offshore wind aspirations, we ranked 34th for electric energy efficiency and 24th for gas efficiency. We are 48th in the nation in installations of advanced metering. Metering and data that will, metering technology that would give us the data that would allow us to understand customer consumption patterns with much greater accuracy and much uh, greater sophistication, such that we would be able to then tell customers when their air conditioning systems are being highly inefficient and near end of life and costing them far more money than they need to and resulting in the 
a demand for far more electricity and greater carbon emissions than they need to. So here we just show a slide that outlines the cost of energy efficiency, the darker red, the smaller graph. What you'll see is two lines uh, and uh, on the, the left axis shows you dollars and the right, the X axis, the, the Y axis shows you dollars, the X axis shows you uh, years from today going forward. And the uh, lower line shows you the uh, cost associated with the program, the, the $2.5 billion spread out over time with an appropriate return. And the yellow line shows you the economic benefits derived from the uh, lower bills and the carbon emissions. So unlike before where you saw the need to spend money above and beyond what the National Academy was proposing in the case of renewables, uh, but below what the National Academy was proposing in the case of nuclear, here you actually see a net benefit uh, to our uh, economic systems and writ large. This would be inclusive of environmental impact and customer bills. The fifth and final item to discuss is if one has made progress on all of these uh, categories, if we've put a price on carbon and we have help clean up the electric supply stack by putting renewables where they make the most sense, by preserving existing nuclear, by using as little electricity as possible through energy efficiency, we would create the opportunity to supply electricity to parts of the economy that don't make use of electricity today. And one of those uh, would be the transportation system. In fact, in the United States today, transportation is the number one source of carbon emissions. It has overtaken the electric generation uh, business in terms of uh, uh, being the leading cause of CO2 emissions. In New Jersey, uh, transportation has, for the longest time, going back 40 years, been the number one source of carbon dioxide in the state. And that's simply because New Jersey has a very high amount of its electric supply coming from nuclear power, as I mentioned before. 40% of the electricity in the state uh, comes from nuclear power. So our electric supply system in New Jersey has been fairly low carbon for many, many decades for that reason. And therefore transportation has been the number one cause. Here we don't have uh, uh, any data on what it would cost to electrify our transportation system in terms of the subsidies uh, that would need to be borne uh, by, by uh, either taxpayers or consumers. With low fossil fuel prices nowadays, specifically low uh, natu uh, natural gas, low oil, and therefore low gasoline prices, uh, it, it is difficult for a consumer strictly on the economics to justify uh, purchasing and operating an electric vehicle. Once again, a price on carbon could help narrow that gap. Uh, but at these prices for petrochemical products, that may not be sufficient. Uh, even at the National Academy of Science numbers. So New Jersey, even though uh, it has all of the attributes that you would think make perfect sense for normal penetration of electric vehicles, we have uh, air quality that can be improved. We have a highly congested state, short commuting distances. And despite the fact that we have all manner of per capita income in the state in the aggregate, New Jersey consistently ranks in the top three in the nation in per capita income. Uh, those are attributes that typically would be very supportive of greater penetration of electric vehicles, yet we are uh, uh, among the lowest in terms of electric vehicle per, per capita uh, of, of those states who are actively pursuing electrification of transportation, as we have uh, stated we wish to do uh, in our energy master plan. Uh, most of this is driven by the, the sort of a challenge associated with is do you put the cart first or the horse first, so to speak, insofar as the absence of electric charging stations results in something known as range phobia. Range phobia results in people not purchasing electric vehicles. The absence of purchasing of electric vehicles results in companies not being interested in installing charging stations and it becomes a vicious cycle. Uh, we have proposed to the Board of Public Utilities to allow us to get the industry going in New Jersey by building charging stations to help de decrease this range phobia, which would then allow consumers to be satisfied that they don't have to worry about gaining access to a charging station and being willing to therefore buy the electric vehicle. Uh, 
if they're willing to overcome the economic uh, consequences, of course, of not having a price on carbon, providing this uh, uh, level playing field that, that is, is missing today. Uh, and we, we're hopeful that the Board of Public Utilities will allow us to play that role. So in summation, because uh, I would love to get a chance to entertain some questions, a price on carbon gives us a rational framework for deciding where we need to make investments to decarbonize our economy. Uh, should that be solar? Should that be offshore wind? Should it be preserving nuclear? Should it be energy efficiency? Once we do all of that, should we be, should we be electrifying transportation? Should some regions of the country concentrate on one? Other regions concentrate on something else. I happen to believe that all regions should be paying attention to energy efficiency. Collectively, we'll make this work. I have no doubt that the will is there uh, and, and the, the sophistication of our STEM community and our policy community uh, inevitably will lead us to realize how important this is. Lastly, I just will point out the following. If one simply is to think about the challenges we've experienced with COVID-19 in dealing with this global pandemic, the, 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 the prospects of dealing with global climate change and its implications are absolutely daunting because unlike COVID-19, global climate change does not lend itself to quarantine, to social distancing, to vaccines. Uh, moreover, the damage that we do to our ecosystem is one that does not lend itself to rapid repair in the absence of technologies that allow for removal of greenhouse gases, which is desperately lagging in terms of uh, any meaningful commitment to that. So, so if, there's a, if there's a broader lesson to be learned uh, from COVID-19, it is the complexity and challenges associated with uh, global problems. And it is not too soon to begin to take that quite seriously and do something uh, here today about climate change. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much. Um, so we do have some questions coming in and people are continuing to add those in the Q&A. And um, we'd like to start off just building on, on one of your last um, statements about, about COVID-19. And um, how do you see society continuing to address the longer term challenges such as climate change at the same time while simultaneously addressing um, some of the immediate crises we're facing, extreme weather events and the COVID-19 pandemic? How can we juggle all of this and make yes. progress forward? That's a, great, that's a great question, Amy. I mean, you know, I, I have, I've said many times that I believe that climate change is the number one challenge, but it is hard to get the attention of someone who is now suffering significant health consequences as a result of COVID-19, or someone who's unemployed because of the economic consequences of COVID-19. And are they willing to spend $400 per ton of carbon? Uh, the answer is no. That's why a price on carbon is so important. We do live in a world of infinite creativity, but finite, uh, economic resources. So it, a price on carbon would allow us to steer our resources more appropriately so that we get the most out of our environmental dollar uh, so that education and healthcare and various other things don't get shortchanged because we're inappropriately investing uh, in carbon mitigation that could be done far more effectively uh, by doing something a little bit different. And building on that, we have a question that just came in from one of our uh, Green Team's alumni who said, I'm glad to see PSEG's collaborative efforts to foster new technologies. Is there a particular innovation that you are excited to bring to New Jersey, create green jobs and accelerate the grid's pace toward carbon neutrality? Yeah, yeah the answer is as emphatically yes. First of all, let me tell you about a technology we're glad to uh, exit from New Jersey. We have retired all of our coal units in New Jersey. We have one remaining coal unit that runs very infrequently in Connecticut, and that will be retiring in the middle of next year. So we will be out of operating coal plants. The technology that we're, we're excited about bringing to New Jersey is advanced metering infrastructure. We think combining that with our energy efficiency passion has a tremendous opportunity for what I would call data scientists. So right now, we read electric meters and gas meters once a month. When you take average data like that, you lose a tremendous amount of valuable information. So if the month of July is an average month in terms of temperature, 
It masks the fact that maybe for one week in July, it was blisteringly hot. And for three weeks in July, it was just a little bit cooler than normal. The ability to see how a customer's consumption uh, changed in that blisteringly hot weather allows us to tell the customer lots of things about their air conditioning unit's current efficiency. And you could take that same, that same little uh, anecdote and apply it to the winter, to the heating system, to the shoulder seasons, to the refrigeration, and to the lighting systems. And we can help customers make better choices about the products that they purchase and the pace at which they retire some technologies that are really costing them far more money than they should be costing them. And that's really all about uh, uh, data processing, data analytics, and understanding how to normalize that data for weather, for economic cycles, for people maybe being home versus uh, being at work. Uh, so so, so, so uh, advanced metering infrastructure, the ability to read metering information at a much more granular level, and then data analytics are technologies that we hope to deploy in the future if we can get the Board of Public Utilities approval. I'm excited about these new technologies as well and some of the emerging fields like data analytics. And, you know, as a public research university and in partnership with PSEG, a partnership we value very much, um, we work every day to make opportunities available to a diversity of deserving individuals, including those who find it difficult to pay for education. Um, for them, the challenge to maintain their employment and to pay the bills while going to college um, just increased quite a bit. The reach to achieve that college education became a lot higher. What advice do you have to um, people who are seeking to gain knowledge and skills needed to work in STEM jobs and those entering the job market right now in STEM? So, so I, I do think that the future is bright for STEM related jobs. I would also not shortchange the importance of skilled craftspeople. That's less of a university uh, research university uh, training ground, maybe more of a community college training ground. But, but whether it's material science to improve the efficiency of solar panels or uh, other material science to improve the uh, uh, mechanical stress uh, uh, tolerance of uh, turbine wind blades, whether it's data analytics and artificial intelligence to help understand correlations between weather patterns uh, uh, consumer behavior and energy consumption, all of these areas are going to be contributing to what I believe is the single most important challenge we face over the long term, that being climate change. Also, don't for a moment uh, exclude non, sort of non-physical sciences, uh, the, the social sciences, consumer behavior, what are the incentive systems we have to put in place to, to, uh, to correct for some of the understandable flaws in the marketplace that keep consumers from doing things that seem logical today. For example, I keep saying energy efficiency lowers bills. Why don't consumers do that? Well, there's technical literacy, there's opportunity costs to deploy capital in other ways. Uh, there are just so many uh, educational methods that we don't understand about getting to our own customers that might help them to make decisions without subsidization, without further prodding, that would be in their economic interest. So I do think that there's a whole raft of, of uh, disciplines that will be brought to bear on this pressing uh, challenge. And, and I do think that it's one that's going to increasingly uh, demand uh, attention and, and, uh, and will, will be a productive career path for many people. So building on that then, um, you know, we're expanding beyond the traditional STEM um, kinds of disciplines into um, incorporating some of the non-STEM majors in addressing these um, problems, these global issues. Um, how do you see partnerships, academic corporate partnerships um, playing a role as we contribute to a greener world going forward? So they are a range of them, right? So one is this conversation we're having right now. Another is the fact that, uh, Two days ago, today's Wednesday, you know, we, we greeted uh, 85 college interns at PSEG who are doing everything from working on that third part of our future vision, making sure that power is delivered more reliably than ever before. Some are working on the second part of that vision. They're working on our, our renewables group. Uh, so so it's, it's actually an internship program. By the way, we do that sh uh, shamelessly so that we can test pilot these students to see if uh, they like us and we like them to hire them in the future. 
we do have partnerships. Uh, I won't mention names, but to some with some of your peer institutions, that is very specific to research and development, modeling grid behavior uh, in in the face of greater penetration of renewables, which can be intermittent, not as easily controlled as gas plants. So I'd say it's a range of activities. It's everything from uh, policy uh, co cooperation uh, studies. Uh, 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 recruiting talent, working with faculty on consultantships, consultancies. Uh, it's, a, it's a broad range of partnerships. And we are quite active with several New Jersey institutions. We work with them too, so there's no, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> we like to collaborate. Um, but, you know, it's something that scientists do. Um, so I have a two-part question, and it comes from two different people, but it, it kind of comes together. Um, sure. So the first part is a little bit about um, something that you said earlier on um, decoupling. And then the second part goes into um, government um, kinds of policy. So, um, you know, we understand that in order to reduce the amount of fossil fuels combusted, there are several strategies and some of these include clean energy and energy efficiencies that you've talked about. And we realize that some systems, um, an energy company makes more money if it sells more energy, right? But the aim for PSEG is to reduce carbon emissions. So without wholesale shift to clean energy or other changes um, to reduce, to reduce the amount um, of rev that would reduce the amount of revenue if if you know you're selling less energy. Right. So can you go a little bit deeper on explain with you know sort of a lay audience, sure. Uh, intelligent sure. people, but um, explain a little bit more on the on how you know maybe a different model or how um, something could happen in order to decouple the costs. Yep. So. So, so the key there is that what you've correctly identified is that our current regulatory system is the problem insofar as we make more the more we sell. I'd like to change that. I'd like us to make more the more we invest and the more that we invest in ways that society wants us to invest. So in the past, that investment was a wire. So I wanna put as much through that wire to make as much money as I can. Well, now I want that investment to be a thermostat and don't send as much through the wire, but let me make money on the thermostat. Decoupling is a system that says you're indifferent to how much of the product you sell, but you are motivated by the investments you make. And you are allowed to collect a revenue stream that compensates you for the investments that you have made. What that means is you have to reduce the variable cost of serving a customer for that to be a win-win. Right, so if I'm investing more and making more, well, gee, aren't you the customer paying more? Not if I'm getting rid of stuff that I used to spend money on. What is the stuff that I used to spend money on? I used to spend money on coal. I used to spend it on natural gas. I used to spend it on uranium-238. So if I can reduce my fuel costs more by more than what I'm spending on that thermostat and that light bulb, we both win. Now to do that, I have to be willing to cannibalize my power plants. But that's a decision PSEG made. We are willing to cannibalize those power plants. We're willing to see them use less and less. And in exchange, what we wanna do is be able to make more money by buying efficient water heaters, by buying efficient thermostats, by buying efficient light bulbs. So that's the, so the key is, is the, is the variable cost of the fuel greater than the cost of the investment needed to avoid using the fuel? And if it is, then you can decouple the amount of electricity used from the revenue stream that we get. And I have no idea if I, I, I am asked that question all the time, Amy, and I keep trying different answers until I get it to the point where it's so painfully obvious, so you, you'll be the judge of that. <laughs> I think a lot of our audience members um, appreciate knowing more. Um, so the second piece then is, um, do you believe a governmental demand for cleaner energy would be more effective than leaving it state to state? Um, or since the altering situations of states means there's no choice but to leave it up to each individual state? Well, uh, it, clearly it would be most effective on an international scale. 
and, and the Paris Accord, it was such an attempt. Uh, we have not been a signature to that, uh, to that agreement, sadly. In the absence of international uh, participation, then yes, national would be better. In the absence of national uh, leadership, then the states, to their credit, are taking on the role. Uh, I would not want to discourage states at all, but by the same token, I think it's important for states to realize that if they are putting a significant economic commitment into this, uh, it's not going to solve the problem uh, in the absence of a broader participation. So, so that's why it's particularly painful when I see that Last three years, I believe, New Jersey subsidized solar energy to the tune of $600 million a year. At the same time, many states in the United States were burning fossil fuels uh, without any economic consequences at all. And that just, that doesn't seem fair. It's a decision we made. I applaud the state for its leadership, but I do think that it's time for the state to question the uh, consequences and whether or not that money couldn't be better spent in another way. Okay. Um, and so we have another question coming in that says, you know, last year our green teams touched on ways to engage stakeholders so that more accurate data could be used to establish more resilient systems. Understanding that all sides must be engaged, are there any new co consumer practices in place or that could be put in place to aid in the gathering of more accurate data? So, so the, the, the best way to get accurate data is by changing our data collection infrastructure. And that's what I was trying to refer to earlier. Uh, our system in New Jersey is very intelligent at the nuclear plant, at the transmission system, but it is very dumb uh, when we get to the meter. And uh, if we could put data collection capability at that meter that is more frequent than a human being walking by once a month to record how much the, the dial has spun, uh, we would be in far better shape. And 48 of the states have done that. W with, with the ability to read meters on a more frequent basis, every five minutes, every five hours, uh, uh, that, that data would inform a whole bunch of uh, changes in behavior, I think. Um, so can you tell us about um, your, absent of a crystal ball, your hopes for um, the future as we're transitioning and um, moving to these more um, energy efficient, more um, technologically um, driven kinds of um, renewable energy sources, um, how, how we can best um, serve communities and incorporate you know, all of these changes um, in a way that, that's really resilient and, and helpful? Uh, well, so, so my hope is that we get much more serious than, than what we have been about energy efficiency. Uh, by the time that first offshore wind farm comes online in 2024, the subsidies for that wind farm and for solar energy together will be close to $1 billion per year from New Jersey consumers. And uh, it's just not clear whether or not we will have the same level of commitment for energy efficiency, which would not need subsidization of that magnitude at all. It, energy, for energy efficiency to work, as I said before, uh, bills will go down, but there will have to be a cross payment, right? In order to get consumers to participate, you will have to have uh, consumer X subsidize consumer Y. You choose who X and Y are so that Y is motivated to install the energy efficiency equipment. The payment from X to Y is less than the overall uh, savings that, that occur. So, it's, so society as a whole benefits from that. Uh, but what I would say is New Jersey's at the cusp right now. It needs to decide, is it going to continue to pour money into rooftop solar and to heavily subsidize the offshore wind or is it going to make a bold statement and stop being 34th in the nation in electric energy efficiency and 48th in the nation in the technology that can propel energy efficiency even further through data analytics? I'm hopeful it chooses uh, the, the more efficient path. 
Got it. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of smart people in New Jersey. I'm hopeful too. Um, and do you think the current drop in oil prices is um, sort of a blip or is that going to impact this trajectory, do you think? Uh, no, I think it's going to impact this trajectory, right? So as you, as you see lower costs for uh, automobile fuel, you'll have a tougher time, absent a price on carbon, getting people to economically justify purchasing electric vehicles. And then uh, remember that that fifth that fifth part of this equation was the electrification of transportation, but that was just the first step in electrifying the economy. But to the extent that industrial processes uh, would realize lower costs by continued use of petrochemicals, uh, that will uh, continue to keep them away from electrifying their industrial processes. So uh, I, I do think low fossil fuel prices, absent a price on carbon, will, will slow our progress. You know, we have, you've probably heard of Project Drawdown, a nonprofit organization and coalition of scholars, scientists, entrepreneurs, and advocates from across the globe that's mapping out and measuring modeling and communicating about a collective array of substantive solutions to global warming with the goal of reaching drawdown. Um, and they compiled a list of their top 100 solutions, um, of, of which your five things are among them, but they're not the top five. So I'm wondering, you know, looking at their list, they have things, um, their top five are onshore wind turbines, utility scale solar, photovoltaics, reduced food waste, plant rich diets, and health education. How did you select your five things? Yeah. So my five things were geared primarily towards uh, this part of the country. Uh, and also uh, recognizing that it, depending upon your location, you cannot simply make one blanket statement. So onshore wind is incredibly inexpensive in West Texas. There is no place to physically put onshore wind in New Jersey. So it's just, so I don't, I, I, I know of Project Drawdown, but I'm not intimately familiar with it. I suspect that they are very talented, smart scientists, but you cannot apply one size and one prioritized list everywhere. I would argue the one exception to that is energy efficiency. Where energy efficiency sometimes is criticized and understandably so, is it can, some people claim, lead to a behavior known as rebound. Okay, so when I leave a room and I have an energy hog of a light bulb, I shut the light. But gee, Ralph Izzo just put this fancy LED bulb in there and he told me that it uses one-tenth the electricity it did before. So I'm not gonna shut the light when I leave the room. Well, if I'm out of the room for 10 times longer than I was before, then I've offset the energy savings. So the rebound effect does lead some people to not put energy efficiency as high as I put it. Uh, I, I think that you couple the energy efficiency investment with educating the consumer and make sure that they don't that they don't misbehave. Another silly example, but sadly it's one that's true is, oh, I just bought this highly efficient refrigerator. Then I take my old refrigerator and I put it in the garage and I store my excess beverages in there. Well, the garage isn't uh, climate controlled. In the summer, that air conditioner is inefficient and working like heck. And you're, you're driving up your consumption even more than before. So I, I wouldn't dispute any of the items on the list that draw down lists. I would dispute if they were to suggest that they only fit, that they fit the same place, that they fit the same way in every place. I don't think that's true. And again, I, I selected those things that I think were most relevant to New Jersey. Relevant either because we should be doing more of them or relevant because we should be questioning the amount of which we are doing it. That's great. Um, are there examples of states where you see um, the states doing energy efficiency well? Yeah, I think California does it very well. I think Massachusetts does it very well. Uh, New York State is, is doing it much better than they have in the past. Uh, I'd say any one of the 34 states that have decoupling, at the very least, what they've done is they've removed the disincentive for uh, utilities to stop uh, uh, advocating uh, for energy efficiency. So, so that's helpful. So you have to realize in, in rough numbers, uh, if we were to make a typical energy efficiency investment today under the current regulatory system, we would lose 10 cents per kilowatt hour and make a quarter of a penny. As much as I want to be a great corporate citizen, I have a fiduciary responsibility to avoid silly mistakes like that. So that's why decoupling is so important and, and, and other states have led the way uh, in that regard. 
Sure, we, we want to have electricity for the long term. Um, so just a couple more. Um, a real shift to green renewable energy would make a huge impact in the fight against climate change. What challenges have you encountered in moving this direction and how can we work together to overcome them? So I, I'd say that there are two challenges. Uh, one is just the, uh, the, the economic challenge associated with not having a price on carbon. And the second is the regulatory construct we've come up with has not always made sense. So you know, we talked a little bit about the cost of solar in New Jersey. Let me give you another example of a regulatory construct. Of this. We have something in the United States called a production tax credit, uh, and it's granted to wind farms. A wind farm gets a tax credit of, uh, I think it's uh, uh, two, two cents per kilowatt hour uh, every time it produces a kilowatt hour of electricity. Uh, many times the richest wind resources are where there's fairly low population density. So there have been times in West Texas and in the Midwest where there's a very rich wind resource where the amount of wind was greater than the demand for electricity. And uh, the wind farmers would actually pay people to take electricity, right? Because if, if they didn't get a chance to run their wind farm, they wouldn't get this two cents credit. So it made sense for them to share that credit with consumers. That literally created what was called a negative marginal discount rate for power. Other competitors, in particular in those regions, nuclear power plants, were literally having to do the same thing. They were having to pay consumers to take their electricity. Otherwise, they, they would have to shut their plant down. You don't want to cycle a nuclear plant. Well, eventually that became so prominent that nuclear plants had to shut down in those parts of the country. Now, wind is a wonderful resource, but it's not always available when you want it. So in order to backstop for the lack of what we call dispatchability of wind, other power plants had to be built. Guess what was built? Natural gas plants. So here we are paying to reduce carbon through something called a production tax credit, and the net effect is that we ended up burning more natural gas than we had in the past because of the retirement of nuclear plants. That's a bad system. So, so, so we just have to, we have to realize what is the goal here? The goal is not to develop renewables. The goal is to reduce carbon emissions. The goal is to reduce SO2, mercury, fine particulates. The goal is a healthy environment. But all too often we get caught up with government saying, I want this technology, I want this groundbreaking ceremony, and I'm willing to pay for it. And then there are consequences to that decision that aren't always consistent with what should be the motivating factor. Sounds like we need more dialogue and more um, education and that's where we can partner. Um, yeah, so we, we like to end all of our sessions on a positive note. Can you share with us um, something positive that you see for the future? Yes, no, uh, so what I would say that is positive is that if, if I look at our carbon emissions as PSEG, they are down 40% over the last 10 years. We currently emit carbon at half the, the, the rate that the rest of the industry does. And the rest of the industry has been reducing its carbon, thus leading to what I said before, transportation now being the number one source of carbon. We are seeing prices come down for electric vehicles. We're seeing range go up for electric vehicles. Uh, I, am, I am encouraged by the fact that uh, Governor Murphy, to his credit, has, is all in on climate change and tackling it. And New Jersey can truly be a leader in energy efficiency, in preserving nuclear, in, uh, in, in developing renewables in an intelligent way that maximizes that environmental dollar. We have an administration today in New Jersey uh, that is uh, committed to that, and we're just delighted to be a partner with them and with our higher education community in making that uh, a reality. That is very positive, and I see a lot of new jobs um, needing to be filled for to to accomplish all of those things that you've um, laid out for us today. So, Ralph Izzo, thank you so much for joining us for the launch of our 2020 Green Teams program. It was really our pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you, Amy.